Um, so, Dan, you and I have decided that we're going to update the listeners on things other than broad beans and the weather. So we can't mention broad beans or the weather. <laughs> so, Dan, how are you? <laughs> I'm alright. I'm alright. I'm alright. Um, My life is just the absence of broad beans. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, and that absence is a thing in itself. Like, wow. The absence of the bean. <laughs> Quite, yeah. Absence is a quality. Hmm. Or something. I don't know. Etc. Et something cetera. philosophical. Philosophical. Um, something philosophical. What would Slavoj Zizek say? <laughs> you know what we could just do is we could become a podcast that talks about current events in our opening thing. So what happened this week? Uh, break, Brexit stuff. Who cares? Um, and... I can't name a single thing that happened this week. I, well, I was, yeah, I was thinking about this. I, well, I mean, there, there is an extent to which I've just switched off from following current events. Sure. And it's very strange as a development because, like, once upon a time, I'd have counted, thought of myself as being the person who was supposed to these things. Almost. Current events guy. Or even just, like, I was so, like, in the habit of checking in with the news, like, listening to the radio news or blah, 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 blah that, like, mm. um, it was kind of written into me, and now I'm avoiding it desperately. I, I like, think it's part of the. I think it's what I think COVID has done it to me. Like, yeah. th- like COVID has sort of yeah. like made the world a lot smaller, and I've quite I've appreciated the retreat into like the small world kind of thing. Yeah, and I don't really want. I don't know. Like, there's something. There's something sort of anxiety triggering about knowing what's going on, um, knowing how things are developing, how things are changing, and, and like. Yes, yeah, I'm just I'm about liking it. the excuse of hiding. <laughs> Yeah, about I feel like I, I mean it is, is. It is. I'm just hiding. I'm just hiding, and it's not good. But Hi- no, hiding's good. Um, yeah. I think like there were things that had happened. Yeah, I can't remember what they are. Well, SpaceX did some stuff, didn't we, they? SpaceX. They 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 crashed a rocket, but it was a success. <laughs> apparently. Oh, didn't hear about that. Oh yeah, that's cool. I don't know. It's difficult because um, mm. I want it to be cool. Yeah. If you name if you name your yeah. spaceship a starship, then I'm like okay. Ah, it's the marketing they got you. I, I, know, I know, I know. Um, um so I'm, yeah, I'm, that was a thing that happened. We both have our computers with us this week, and I'm on BBC. Um, oh right, oh, okay. And there's not okay. really any, there's Just nothing no, no. interesting going on, <laughs> or at least that's on BBC. I'm sure there's plenty I was, of interesting I, stuff. I mean, there. Uh, I have a lot of imaginary conversations, and one of the ones I was having at one point was a defense of as to why this podcast like just didn't care yeah. about current events. Yeah, I think this is why. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's so many other like current events. I mean, it's difficult, right? Because like we are we're we're reading things which would hopefully inform our understanding of the present. But if we don't actually make any effort to engage with the present, <laughs> yeah. we're kind of failing in our day to day. I suppose. Is this but, the most like, recent thing we've read? No, Ellen Meekson's what? Oh, and Tribune. Tribune. Yeah. 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 Yeah, a year ago. Or is it the 12th? Oh, it's the 11th. Okay, yeah. It's the anniversary of the, the election loss tomorrow. Uh, oh, so two days ago was... I think two days ago. Sad. We were recording on the 11th. I think it was the 9th of December. Mm. A decade ago um, was the day that um, Parliament passed the bill which raised rose uh, student tuition fees in the UK from oh, like cool. £3,000 a year to like nine. And I believe that was under the Tories, Under correct? the Tories, yes. in a coalition with the Liberal Democrats. Interesting. The Liberal, Liberal Democrats. Democrats. Yeah, I don't know. For our American listeners, or for our, like, Zuma listeners, I suppose. <laughs> Which I think maybe we... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> zoom, zoom, zoom. Um, <laughs> the Liberal Democrats campaigned in 2010 on a, a, an explicit policy of abolishing tuition fees. For Sick. Students. And by virtue of that, garnered a huge amount of support from students, and the National Union of Students supported them. Understandable. Um, and then, <laughs> David Cameron's Conservative Party was the largest party, but didn't win a majority, and the Liberal Democrats went into coalition mm. with them, and then proceeded to vote through tuition fees, uh, a tuition fee rise, and then the Liberal Democrats were annihilated as a political party and haven't recovered yet. Here's what that is. Revolutionary patience. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's some kind of. They're playing the long it's, yeah. game. Oh, long, you mean the Liberal long, Democrats? Long. The Liberal Democrats. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I don't know what constituents <laughs> do they hope to tap into. I really don't know. I really don't know. Um, but well, but that was it. Was it? But there was a big protest that day, and I was there, and it was good fun. Mm. It was yeah, good fun. fun. They um <laughs> they'd been a protest about a month before, when um students occupied the the building that the. Conservative headquarters was headquartered in, mm. and mm. trashed a load of shit and broke mm. some windows and cool. That was pretty good. I was Love there that it. day, but I was just a bystander. Uh-huh. And then on the, <laughs> on uh, on December 9th there was another big protest. 
it was meant to we were, the students were meant to march past Parliament and Parliament had been like fenced off with Harris fencing and stuff mm. because they really didn't want students getting into Parliament Square. Mm. Uh, but the protest got to Parliament Square and then pulled down all the fencing and occupied the square. And so, it was the the police were incredibly brutal on that day. There oof. were sort of horse charges of students. And, <laughs> horse charges. Um, Why? And there was a, a few cases of students being quite badly beaten. A famous oh, case of a student in a wheelchair that was um, Jesus. Look it up. Look up some footage of or, oh. or look up some footage of that those protests and the um, the police reaction because huh. it's enlightening. It's enlightening. As bad as things are. Have been a lot of protests recently. Recently, here, uh, I feel like the last one that I was at, or even that I really saw, was the Black Lives Matter protest. Sure. When was that? That was a while ago. Yeah, in the summer. You mean? Was that the summer? It must have been. There September, were. There, there, I mean, October. there were no food, food, June, and food, July. I mean, the the yeah. The, I mean, just the most recent ones. Yeah, George Floyd was here. killed at the end of March, May, wasn't he? And How the was ones that kicked ago? off in uh, preceding that in America. But there were sort of sympathetic and analogous and. I don't want to say it was all just in sympathy with what was going on in America. Obviously, mm, it was highlighting the problems here as well. Um, there were sizable protests. Oh, I just mean because I was here for one. Oh, you mean in Canterbury? Yeah, in Canterbury. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. Huh. Or, or we just admitted. We just admitted. I don't, know. I don't know whether it was any know. great secret. Or... <laughs> all of our stalkers. Oh, God. Yeah, no, no, we mean, we mean Canterbury, now. Iceland. Yeah, yeah, Whenever yeah. I type in Canterbury... Canterbury, on... New Zealand. Exactly. Yeah, Canterbury, New Zealand always yeah, comes yeah, up on maps. Yeah, yeah. How many people could live there? Presumably more, if that's what always comes up. But a few, a few. Yeah. Uh, well, there you um, go. Um, let me just because I got to do somewhere? it. Broad beans, still no news. Still no broad beans. Yeah. <laughs> still no broad yeah, beans. We've got. I think it's uh, lamb's lettuce that's growing in mm. in the garden. That's cool. I'm gonna call it a cold frame. It's really it's, it's like a raised bed with a, some panes of glass on top of it. It's <laughs> basically a cold frame, right? Yeah, it's so. a cold frame. So I don't yeah. know. They're growing at the moment. Yeah. You showed me that you have strawberry plants growing, and that made me realize that at the allotment, I've been ripping out all of those thinking they were weeds of this one bed. Oh, really? Oh, oh you indeed, thought they were so weeds and they were strawberries. There yeah, are indeed yeah, yeah, strawberry yeah. plants. Yeah. Oh. We, we get quite a lot of wild strawberries that grows at the back of the house as well. Oh, cool. So you get, I mean, they're tiny little, tiny little sure. things. Um, mm. Munchkin strawberries. Mm, but they're mm. quite nice. Cool. You've got to eat them when you see them. There's no crop, yeah. I don't think. <laughs> um, Unlike the beets. Unlike the beets, yeah. The beets. Dan I mean, has fifty-three tubs full of beets. Yeah, if anybody wants any <laughs> any any beetroot, let yeah, me email know. the podcast auxiliary statements at gmail dot com. We'll send you some beets. If you pay the postage, I'll pencil some for you. <laughs> <laughs> just in the in the in the in a mason bag. jar. Yeah. <laughs> just write the address on the mason jar. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. put a stamp on the top. <laughs> Saw someone once sent a potato through the mail just by writing the address on the potato in the mail service in America that's delivered it. Nice. It's good to know. Nice. Yeah, I wonder whether that would happen. Here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be like, put this potato in my. I bag. mean, it might happen here, but the the, the mail is so um, stretched at the moment. The post office is so stretched. At the mm. moment. Indeed, indeed. I don't know is there are there a private? Oh yeah, of course there are private. It was privatized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, are they private? I mean, the the Royal Mail is was is is a private company. Really, yeah, like yeah, full. Yeah. Oh, wow, geez. it was private. Yeah, it was privatized. I don't know. I think of it as being done as part of the sort of Cameron Osborne. Um, Sounds like a rock government. Star. <laughs> so it must have been twenty fifteen or twenty fourteen. Awesome. Maybe it was put in train in twenty fifteen, and then it, then it actually like reached fruition a few years later. Hmm. Um, that sucks. I mean, they, they, I mean, I don't quite know very much about how it's operating now that it's privatized. I don't know anything about how it operated before it was privatized. <laughs> the only thing that I really know about it is that they criminally undersold the the the, the, the shares when the government sold them, and then the first de- the day of their sale, they rocketed up in price when people started when investors started reselling them. I say criminally. I don't know. Criminally, they, they, yeah, criminally, rhetorically criminally. The criminal and, royal mail. Um, obviously, it was a crime to sell it off in the first place, but. Mm. Um, it was really, really, I mean, like all of these, like, I mean, like all, all um, privatizations of state assets, it's really just a bung to the private sector. Sure. Like, I feel like I would be a bad investor because I wouldn't have even thought to commodify mail. Like, yeah. mail just seems like, <laughs> mail, commodify yeah, mail. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, can, what could we commodify that nobody's thought to commodify? Um, uh-huh. Oh, you were, we were talking recently, um, water futures have become a oh, thing yeah. now. There's now a market in... in in the price of water in the future. I'm investing in water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, it sounds like, a, I mean, I don't know. It either sounds like <laughs> lunacy or incredibly uh, intelligent because like water, incredibly abundant. Uh, aside from the morals of like sure. trading in water, just as a sort of like, as an, an, as an abstraction, like it's both like 
incredibly common, but also incredibly necessary. Sure. So I don't yeah. know what... <laughs> Maybe we should get some water, barrels of water. Yeah. There's enough water here for now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Don't know how we'd store it. Yeah, barrels. <laughs> Bathtubs. Bury it in the garden. I mean, how are you going to do that to something you can just get out of the tap? You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe, Again, I'm I mean, maybe we should maybe we should just bottle it out of the tap <laughs> and then wait for it to appreciate. I mean, that's what literally every bottled water yeah. company does anyway. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. just take water out of the tap and put it in a bottle. Um, all right, what's that? We're a current events podcast now. Yeah. And so, as a current events podcast, we're going to be discussing this new thing called the internet. Oh, yeah. one of these that new, newfangled things. This newfangled thing, the internet. So this week, Dan, uh, we're reading The Californian Ideology by Richard Barbrook and Andy Cameron. This was a... I just kind of figured it was like... I don't know what I figured it was, but we found out that it was published in... I forget which magazine, and then it was published in I forget which magazine again, and then it just kind of became like a thing that um, a lot of lefties in the 90s have read. Published in 1995. Um... And, yeah, it's kind of just about, it's written by two commies, um, kind of just speculating, I suppose, slash not really speculating, um, because, you know, a lot of the trends that they discuss about the future of telecoms industries and stuff had already started to happen, um, about, yeah, the future of technology and what that's going to mean for um, our social lives and um, just kind of our lives in general, right? I mean, I don't know, I might be giving a little bit of short shrift, but it's great. And the whole point, the reason why it's called the Californian ideology is because they are um, uh, trying to make sense of this new ideology, market-driven ideology coming out of California, that came out of California that um, uh, helped to kind of explain this drastic moment of social change, right? Um, just the first quote of the day, just super short, they say, at such moments of profound social change, anyone who can offer a simple explanation of what is happening will be listened to with great interest. At this crucial juncture, a loose, orion- a loose alliance of writers, hackers, capitalists, and artists from the West Coast of the USA have succeeded in defining a heterogeneous orthodoxy for the coming information age, the Californian ideology. So, yeah, it's just about how we've made sense of this massive shift in technology and the impact that that's had on our lives, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hypermedia. They, yeah, they are, yeah, they argue it's really the only narrative game in town for what it is that's happening. Um, yeah. They do a very good job of putting it in a very specific context. So all of this is about the sort of like political and social history of California, mm. um, the ideological frameworks in which uh, these people were thinking. So it's it's very material in a lot of cases. Actually, it's oh, not sure. um, yeah. it's not high minded speculation. It's mm. really like they're yeah they're looking at the 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 tech industry and um, how it's formed and fashioned, explaining why this sort of rationale for events or this sort of governing ideology, I suppose, Ooh. has come into existence. Yeah, and it's quite convincing. I mean, it's, it's quite convincing. It's, it's an old essay now, and obviously we can update it f- even from our lay understanding of um, what's happened over the past 20 or 25 years. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we are aware we of hope. the internet. The internet. Um, <laughs> We're all doing it. And um, quite how some of the predictions have and haven't played out. Mm. But they're, but they're basically they're talking about the predictions of other people rather than their own kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and this, I think, the reason that we decided to do this one is because it does actually really nicely take us from last week's episode all about the new right and Reagan and all of the tawdry tales coming out of California to kind of a slightly more modern era 25 years ago <laughs> <laughs> about um, what California being, you know, the place of Silicon Valley and, you know, Los Angeles, San Francisco, all of these big tech places, um, what influence like once again the kind of like rise in new trends in california had on the rest of the country and indeed in the world um so yeah so he kind of he starts us off by talking a little bit about the um new right right well actually he doesn't start it off but we we should probably start off by talking a little bit about the new right because this has to do with kind of like this ideology was formed as the confluence between the new right and the new left which i was just saying to you before this i never made the connection that they were both kind of called exactly the same thing and perhaps one was reacting to the other <laughs> which seems fairly obvious in hindsight but um yeah he he you, well i guess he i should stop saying he it's two guys um they both they, they, it's woke. <laughs> it is they. woke yeah <laughs> my, my plurals are all wrong um 
he god damn it they <laughs> sorry I'm just, no, that, yeah, no, I don't know. that might have been offensive I shouldn't have said that <laughs> no I'm just bad at stay, just saying stay, words stay. um uh, there's, I just just so we're all, uh, not for myself, but just uh, for all people in general. I just uh, I prefer the pronoun they. I uh, just like oh, there you go. they all the time. My my preference would just be to call everybody they. I like that. It makes things a lot easier. I feel like that, particularly in writing. Yeah. All this fucking he she nonsense, <laughs> like he slash she, like uh, I don't. Yeah, get it. Miss me. Well, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't know why. Like people don't just. Mm. When you're talking about a, 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 a hypothetical person, if you're talking about a hypothetical person, uh, just say yeah, they. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. I don't know. I don't I, or we could just use dude. I guess that's dude. a difference. It's not really a pronoun. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm in favor of it. Kids. I was talking about that. Kids. <laughs> yeah, God these damn kids. kids. <laughs> um, these authors then use the example in 1969 on May 15th, actually, to be more specific, when Governor Ronald Reagan, our boy Ronald Reagan... Uh, uh, the most handsome man alive uh, uh, ordered a bunch of cops basically to go into um, People's Park, wherever that is, I guess near Berkeley, and just basically like beat the shit out of a bunch of hippies who were protesting, right? Yeah. And he, the, uh, the authors again make the point that um, this was kind of like the butting heads of the two, quote unquote, like if you want to be really broad about it, like the two ideologies of the day, the like hippies and the like chud free marketeers like Ronald Reagan-y would go on to be like Newt Gingrich-y type people um, and he's, they say that that is where like they use that as a metaphor for like what would become the Californian ideology this like abrupt confrontation between these two ideologies uh, that kind of bends a little to become a little bit of horseshoe theory and we get the best <laughs> of both worlds <laughs> I guess it's supposed to be like the new left and the new right. right? Sure, yeah. I mean, uh, that yeah. What the California ideology ideology um, is a sort of hybrid amalgamation of these two trends. Mm. Um, I think it would probably be fair to say, particularly in what we listened to, what we read last week, um, with the basic triumph of the new right um, in American politics in the eighties, um, and the relative like defeat of the left. Mm. Or at least um, the countercultural left, the new left, mm. hippies. the sort of hippie mm. hippie movement kind of thing. In a lot of ways, it's the hippies either sort of acquiescing to the new reality of uh, neoliberal Reagan America yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, in in some respects, it's a it's it's um, a group of hippies adapting their themselves to operate in this new world really i don't know whether it's so much an amalgam of the two as opposed to mm. um the i mean we, we, we'll get into it in a minute because there are certainly reasons why um a particular type of um individuous individualistic mm. um, but also sort of market orientated sort of understanding of tech would also appeal to the counter what the remainder of the countercultural left by the yeah. time they got to the eighties and nineties. Totally. Um, yeah. Um, interesting you say that. I, I had just kind of been thinking about it as like a, we take a little bit of this, a little bit of that from both ideologies and make this. But I wonder it kind of. Well, is I suppose. Like... Yeah, I mean, I suppose there are things in both which are um, com- complementary. Sure. So it's not entirely sure, that sure, the left sure. acquiesced entirely to everything that the right had mm. had to offer them, mm. or that um, the new framework the new rules of neoliberal capitalism had to offer them um, and in some ways we can look at this i suppose as a critique in some ways of of the new left of sure. the countercultural left that some but potentially is i suppose the critique you could make i suppose is that they they were quite in focused on liberating the individual in a lot of ways uh, which is not a um, not something that we want to argue against sure but I suppose you have to do it in train with liberating society. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, it just becomes like an Ayn Randian kind of. Like, quite. Yeah, and this know. is where the overlap comes, right? Yeah. They yeah. The, what they did was adapted themselves quite easily to the kind of um, just the kind of exceptional individual kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. Um, there's nothing sort of collective or social. It's all about the sort of triumph of the will, the kind of yeah. like Ubermenschian, I suppose. I'm just getting a bit grandiose now, but like <laughs> yeah. Ubermenschian kind of like. Dan, you're scaring me. Tech nerd. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny because it, I think both of them are this, you know, both trains of like individualistic thought are responses to kind of like the atomized lives that we all live. Because it's like if you're constantly being told that it's like kind of you need to be this person, you have to be the one to make the change in your life. 
there's no sense of community anywhere. Everything's all been stripped. It's like, you know, be the best person that you can be and change the world for the better. Or like the kind of like more right wing one, but like be the best person you can be and dominate the world. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. The like Ayn Randian view of stuff. So let's dive into what the little bit more to what those kind of goddamn hippies uh, thought about things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'll read another quote, and this one's a little bit longer. So uh, Barbrook and Cameron say, emboldened by over 20 years of economic growth, they, kind of meaning just like the hippies, the radical hippies, believed that world history was on their side. In sci-fi novels, they dreamt of an ecotopia, a future California where cars had disappeared, industrial production was ecologically viable, sexual relationships were egalitarian, and daily life was lived in community groups. For some hippies, this vision of the future could only be realized in rejecting scientific pro progress as a false god and turning to nature. Uh, I'll do a little editorializing. We're not interested in them. Others, in contrast, believed that technological progress would inevitably turn their libertarian principles into social fact. Crucially, influenced by the theories of Marshall McLuhan, these technophiliacs sought that thought that the convergence of media, computing, and telecommunications would inevitably create the electronic agora, a virtual place where everyone would be able to express their opinions without fear of censorship. Despite being a middle-aged English professor, McLuhan reached, preached a radical message that the power of big business and big government would be imminently overthrown by the intrinsically empowering effects of new technology on individuals. So I'll just quote McLuhan really quickly. Electronic media, he said, um, would abolish the spatial dimension. By electricity, we everywhere pr resume person-to-person -person relations as if on the smallest village scale. It is a relation in depth and without delegation of functions or powers. Dialogue supersedes the lecture. So this is just like the same crap that you always hear whenever there's like a new thing, like the TV or the radio. It's like, the TV is going to make everybody smarter. Or like, the radio is going to make everybody smarter. Or like, Facebook's going to make everybody smarter. Mm -hmm. And it just becomes instantly commodified and you mm. instantly get the opposite of all this right? yeah, yeah yeah the lecture i, does, I would you know, i would like to kind of ally myself with their aspirations to some uh, extent. sure yeah yeah um, it's high-minded it's yeah. nice, <laughs> nice to think about it. it'd be cool um i mean the, i mean the thing to fixate on perhaps to begin with is quite how technologically determinist it all is absolutely um just as, as you were saying like mm. the, it's it's the 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 capacities of the technology will necessitate a change in our social relations. Yeah. Um, but what's really happened is our social relations have defined what it is that uh, that sca the sca the scale of um, I mean we all know what it is to live in the contemporary computer age and what mm -hmm. digital communications mean, mm. um, and they don't seem to have. Uh, fashion themselves into something that we might call a digital agora or correlate anything yeah. with what Marshall McLuhan's high-minded uh, yeah. description of what we might get. Mm. Um, but yeah, and I wonder, I wonder, I mean, obviously the new left in a lot of ways was um, reacting against the the classical left of the party and the trade union, sort of like the, sure. dis the disciplined. Totally. Um sort of square in a different sense kind of thing like mm, um, mm. and was counterposing to that a sort of uh, much more uh, liberated individual and also they were directing their interests uh, political activity on sort of much more um, sort of polymorphous yeah. collection of interests yeah what we what I suppose we now consider to be like the new social movements mm. um, the fight for like women's liberation and gay rights and mm. uh, to protect the environment and all those other collection of uh, campaigns that I have no problem why I'm supportive of and have no, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Have no problem with. Yeah. Um, but I wonder whether they did sacrifice something in the sort of like the sort of the collectivity of um, how the sort of more orthodox left perhaps thought about class, thought about party, thought about organisation it was those kind of things which would weave a, a kind of collectivity um, which the new left in this guise was perhaps lacking. Mm. Um, and it was that sort of, l that lack of the sort of like, um, sort of attitude of solidarity, which allowed their sort of like left libertarianism to so easily sort of like um, be sort of like transform itself into something which was... Mm. Uh, it could operate very easily in a much more sort of like right wing libertarian totally uh, arena. I well, suppose. to a certain extent, I mean, and I don't want to drive this home too much because it's like at this time, 
you know, there were like huge communist parties in America, right? I mean, yeah. like maybe not necessarily yeah, like yeah, what yeah. we'd call like workers parties. I suppose, yeah, like that, that. That, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's probably an unfair sketch that I've just made because a lot of things there were a lot of organizations that were in the new left but was still organizational sure. right like people sure. were moving away from traditional communist parties and becoming like some of the biggest parties in the u.s at this time were like maoist organizations yeah. which are just massive <laughs> which is but insane. like but a lot of people who align themselves with maoism were, were also aligned with would have aligned themselves with the new left kind of thing totally so it's not just the sort of like um the sort of free love hippies it's also yeah. the sort of like yeah they're all I don't know. Yeah, 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 no, like party kind of people. Yeah, yeah, I, know, I mean, like the Students for Democratic Society sure. were massive and they were part of the new left. Mm, and, mm. I don't know. Yeah, um, it's, you do just get the feeling that like he is talking about a specific group of people, obviously, like what Mike Davis was talking about, like what starts out as a small kind of like, maybe not even statewide thing in California eventually takes over the whole country. Um, he's talking about a small group of people, maybe, or at least a group of people who have perhaps put social... Um, uh, I don't know if activism is the right word, but like social problems ahead of the overarching kind of like larger project of like capitalist socialism sure. or like communism, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's talking about a very small group of people in the sense that like he set the scene, right? Um, the new left at its heights in the 60s and 70s, um, engaged in all these different political uh, campaigns, massive mobilizations against the Vietnam War, mm. um, pushes for massive social uh, racial reform and it's only a small number of these people that were then influenced so heavily by McLuhan yeah. um, developed a kind of like technologically determinist um, means to achieving their utopian vision mm. um, and s therefore started to engage very heavily in this sort of new media and the development of these new technologies mm. Um and it's a sort of this small cast of hippies who, um, as as time developed, um, came to define yes. the Californian ideology. Absolutely, yeah. And yeah, let's go back to just like the New Left's idea of technological determinism, because um, again, like, just draw as many parallels as you want to like the origin of capitalism, right? Where it was like, what we think of as like the commercialization theory of capitalism just happens because it was always going to happen. And as soon as we got the plow, the cotton gin and the steam engine in the loom, it was just going to happen, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's the same thing here. Like, I don't know whether these people were thinking about like socialism necessarily when they were talking about, it doesn't actually sound like it at all, but they were thinking about like a new mode, a new way of doing things where we could all just be ourselves, dude. And like, sure, you know, yeah, like, don't worry I've, about the man. I think it's certainly a sort of like, um, certainly, uh, anarchist communism yeah um mm. communism in the sense of communes and maybe nothing else <laughs> sure yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway uh, uh, yeah reorganizing redefining collectivity discovering sure, new sure, ways of yeah. living there's something very prefigurative about what the the new left were doing what certain mm. aspects of the new left were doing what we might call the hippies were doing um <laughs> fucking hippies sort of like living the new world in the, in the surrounding of the old one kind mm. of thing mm. um I mean, the merits of that kind of strategy we'll have to debate at some other time. Kind sure. Of time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cart before the horse. I will say Sep perhaps, uh, perhaps, several perhaps. carts. But I do, yeah, but horses. yeah, but it, this does this does um, fit into a sort of general course of thinking that we've been doing over multiple episodes about uh, yeah technological determinism and um, without a sufficient amount of focus on the sort of like active social relations and how they're lived and totally acted kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's almost like that's what we need to be focusing yeah, on. Perhaps, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, so the authors then kind of use that technological determinism as a bridge to discussing the overlapping beliefs of the new right with the new left. <clears throat> so I'll read another quote. Um, uh, they say, This bizarre hybrid is only made possible through a nearly universal belief in technological determinism. Ever since the 60s, liberals, in the social sense of the word, have hoped that the new information technologies would realize these ideals. But responding to the challenge of the new left, the new right has resurrected an older form of liberalism. Economic liberalism. Dun, dun, dun. In the sense of the collective freedom sought by the hippie radicals, they championed the liberty of individuals within the marketplace. Yet even these conservatives couldn't resist the romance of the new information technologies. Back in the 60s, McLuhan's predictions were reinterpreted as an advertisement for new forms of media, computers, and telecommunications being developed 
by the private sector. Dot, dot, dot. I'm going to skip a bit. This retro utopia echoed the predictions of Asimov, Heinlein, Heinlein? I think that's how you pronounce it. Never read any of his books. And other macho sci-fi novelists whose worlds were always filled with space traders, super slick salesmen, genius scientists, pirate captains, and other rugged individualists. Uh, this path of technological progress didn't always lead to ecotopia. It could instead lead back to the America of the founding fathers. And I think specifically by that, they mean like Jeffersonian democracy. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I love Asimov. And it's funny thinking like, oh my God, his like foundation, the foundation trilogy was like one of the first um, kind of like classic sci-fi uh, series that I read. And I just fell in love with it. And I love mm -hmm. it so much. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty heavily inspired by uh, Edward Gibbon. Maybe that was why. But uh, it's interesting because yeah, all of his books are totally just like the rugged space trader, the individual, the dude doing this to like make the money to like, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe perhaps engaging in, uh, arbitrage uh -huh. and going from one space system to the other. <laughs> Quite, yeah. Um, and that is much more of a like new right view of individualism, I think. Yeah. And a new left. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's what I, I haven't read any other more, but I'd like to, mm. one of the things that's always frustrated me to some extent about, um, futurism, um, and the way these things are thought about, like people can cast their minds like thousands of years into the future and their characters are still sort of like traders or like <laughs> we're going to set up this space colony okay what is their sort of commodity export going to be yeah. how is their economy going to function unobtainium kind of yeah. <laughs> but i suppose so but I, but I suppose i suppose capitalist social relations could go on forever right like yeah uh, and i mean unless you i don't know maybe that's not true maybe there is some kind of breakdown of capitalism happening and coming but mm. um it seems quite resilient so far um yeah yeah but there's never a, there, there is the question never is never asked like do uh technological developments allow for different social relations to come about kind of thing yeah um yeah in those kind of like sci-fis um mm. either amongst sort of like future speculation or mm. um Mm. sci-fi writing sci-fi like arbitrage I don't know <laughs> yeah yeah I mean the, the the question of the sort of rugged individual to some extent is slightly different um mm. I don't know how you, yeah I don't know how you'd write a novel that wasn't I mean a show yeah. didn't have a character it was at least like yeah. an interesting individual to some extent but <laughs> I'm sure they exist my communist you're, you're, you're the literary guy I don't have really no idea really I'm know. waiting for a book about a loser <laughs> just some jerk but my understanding was Asimov's writings are very much more like uh, grand historic histories than they yes. are um, yeah yeah, but all of his characters, like in Foundation, in the second book specifically, it's like a lot of it is just about this guy called the Mule, who's just like this space trading Han Solo esque kind of guy. Okay. <laughs> it's just like okay, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, I understand the romance of that kind of character. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, of course. But I mean, like you do see kind of like what the authors like, what the point is that they're making, where it's like um, the individualism that the New Right was attracted to in this kind of like technologically determinist futurism was like so lame. <laughs> It's just like, but what about if we sold stuff? It's yeah. Like, what about if we introduced markets? It's like, I mean, God, it's, what a I mean, loser. it's quite. I mean, it's quite sad in some respects. Like, you can imagine these sort of tech nerds like reading Asimov, uh. and then um, or whoever Heinlein, maybe yeah, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, and then deciding how they could become some kind of like uh, tech ubermensch. Yeah. And. Um, Becoming, I don't know who's a, who's a good example of Steve yeah. Jobs, I suppose. Yeah, and, oh, uh, God. And uh, I Bill I was, Gates. And I was, <laughs> yeah, I was watching something on YouTube today. I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe, I mean, it, I mean, it strikes me as quite sad. It is sad. Yeah. Goddamn nerds. In a, in a, yeah, in a pejorative sense. <laughs> um, I was what watching lo something. What losers? Yeah, what losers? All of these billionaires are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was watching something on YouTube, and the suggested video the other day was, um, it was like something the title is something like steve jobs compilation of owning hecklers and it was just like wh who's first of all who's heckling steve jobs i probably would have been i would have bought like tomatoes and stuff but secondly it's like uh, that that just blew my losers, mind the after losers reading who are making the compilations of <laughs> yeah, exactly well, it's probably something that works for apple but it had like millions of views and after reading this it just blew my mind this yeah, like yeah, individualist yeah. like watching it can on you imagine, youtube you, can you imagine how obnoxious the the steve jobs reply guys would be if <laughs> steve jobs was alive like, oh my god there i mean still i suppose reply guys I, I, yeah yeah i bet there is a steve jobs I bet a they steve just jobs do it for account. i don't know but there's that infinitely no. many steve jobs accounts god <laughs> somebody's tweeting has steve jobs steve jobs stands yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know enough iPhones. about him. I heard he's a pro. Apple, incredibly boring. Apple? Yeah. Yeah. iPhones. So it's, it's, it's incredibly it's, boring. So, yeah, so Technology in general. Phones. Te technology boring. is just lame. <laughs> I don't want to be a Luddite, but like it's kind of lame. 
Um, well, no, I, it's not. No, no, it's this. Uh, uh, my ge- my ge- my general my general <laughs> general critique, general theory of these uh, things is that like, um, what I want is a mobile phone that lasts a decade. Sure. And by the time that decade has come along, these tech people will have invented a new piece of technology that's like life changing. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, sure. And instead, you just get a new iteration of the phone every year, as well yeah. as a few more pixels on the phone, and like yeah. it's not like it's gotten smaller, it's gotten smaller, and there's more cameras on it, mm. and it's probably listening to you with a greater degree of surveillance. Yeah, like yeah. that part's it's boring. Cool. It's boring. Do better. Yeah, do Try better. Harder. What uh, what could it do? Maybe. Yeah, what could it do? Maybe holograms. Like... Holograms. Oh, no, I got well, holograms. All right. <laughs> yeah, Apple hired Dan. Jeez, that seems like a gimmick. Wow. All right. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't care. Dan I don't want it. Care. I don't really want it in my life. What holograms? No. I'd like holograms. I, I could have more friends. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could. Have... I could have more friends if I had a hologram. <laughs> exactly. Phone, so like, yeah. You know, I guarantee you. <laughs> all of my hologram friends. Yeah. All my friends on the holodeck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't think I'm a loser. <laughs> my brother and I always have like a running joke about like never look at Will Riker's holodeck history. <laughs> 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 I guarantee you, if Apple comes out with like holograms or whatever for their new phone, the f- the first thing they're going to do is a Steve Jobs hologram and it's going to be so lame. Yeah. It's going to be like, uh, I wear jeans and I built this computer in my basement. It would just be an Alexa hologram or something. Or like, Oh God. <laughs> oh God. Cortana will actually like yeah. come out of the phone. Cortana. Right? Oh my God. <laughs> That'd be quite cool. Okay. That'd if you, if cool. you're going to, if you're going to call your AI <laughs> assistant Cortana, mm. like at least have there be like a holograph. Who's Cortana? Which one's Cortana? Halo. I don't know. No, oh, no, sorry. Yeah, but, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm sure one of them uses, sure these. Microsoft. Microsoft, it must be Microsoft. Yeah, it must be Microsoft. Yeah. 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 Cortana. Yeah. Oh, duh, because Microsoft owns, oh, I never made that connection. Uh, Xbox. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, the Xbox X. Um, what were we talking about? You know what's funny is that in this, he talks about, like, who actually made a lot. So he, yeah, yeah, the yeah, authors yeah. go into a lot of, like, typical, like, uh, you know, technological progress is, like, not individualistic because you're building on the soldier of giants, et cetera, et cetera. We'll get there. Mm-hmm. But I thought that one point where he was like, uh, actually, the first internet was just made by nerds sitting in their basement because they wanted to play D&D. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you resonated with. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like, whoa, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the idea of, like, the... I mean... What Mariana Matsukata calls the entrepreneurial state, right? Yes. So much of so much of the technology that um, we associate with these kind of like uh, great capitalist institutions, these great capitalist advancements, yeah. <laughs> were really just based on technologies that had been developed by uh, this of course, states. basically like basically mostly like military apparatus. This kind yeah. of thing. Like, it's all DARPA and like yeah. He bought up how the first IBM computer was just they built it because the government during the Korean War was like we need a computer and they're like yeah, oh, yeah, what yeah, 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 <laughs> that's yeah, never yeah, been built before yeah, yeah, and they're like a yeah, computer yeah, yeah, yeah. so so forth um, so forth. But yeah, it's also but, the, but the, the but the other interesting thing that I, I hadn't really thought about before was um uh quite how much of the early tech industry was predicated on like. What's they called them? Like gifts of some kind or other? I mean, they were they, sort DIY, of DIY like like computing. Stuff, yeah. And then also this kind of like, um, what I interpreted to mean a kind of like, um, sort of solidaristic behavior between developers, mm. right? This technology is developing and they're all sort of sharing ideas mm. and they're sort of gifting one piece of technology to the other person kind of thing. Mm. I assumed that's what it meant kind of thing. So ne- not necessarily developing in like a free market um free market uh, competitive environment mm. but much more as a kind of like social endeavor yeah. between these sort of diy hobbyists computer nerds kind of thing which that's cool yeah, yeah that's yeah, really yeah, which cool is, which is a, yeah just another way of sort of like disproving to some extent that kind of like totally uh free market is the only explanation for these things like it's only <laughs> I su- jack has taken to saluting every time i say free market just so you know i've always done oh that. okay i just never yeah, always salute when I you say free market noticed. i had something else to say as well i'm not sure what it was um, about the DIY gifts yeah something about gifts and DIY and can I hit you with a quote all about that yeah please you thinking about it yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah exactly what Dan's talking about the authors go in and say capitalist entrepreneurs often have an inflated sense of their own resourcefulness in developing new ideas and give little recognition to the contributions made either by the state their own labor force or just the wider community all technological process progress is cumulative i can never say that word you know what it was it depends on the results of a collective historical process that must be counted at least in part as a collective achievement hence as in every other industrialized country american entrepreneurs have inevitably relied on state intervention and diy and initiatives to nurture and develop their industries when japanese companies threaten to take over the american microchip 
market, the libertarian computer capitalists of California had no ideological qualms about joining a state-sponsored cartel organized to fight off the invaders from the East. Until the net programs allowing all community participation within cyberspace could be included, Bill Gates believed that Microsoft had no choice but to delay the launch of Windows 95. As in other sectors of the modern economy, the question facing the emerging hypermedia industry isn't whether or not it will be organized as a mixed economy, but what sort of mixed economy it will be. Kind of exactly what it wound up being exactly <laughs> what he was saying there. Just one more capitalist kind of dominate everything. Yeah, yeah. And there, 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 we, we, there was something that was in the Mike Davis essay that we read last week that we didn't really, um, we didn't really speak about, but it's... It, it, has its parallel in this right mm. like um so much of the the new sort of capitalist enterprises that uh, developed in the sun belt um and came to form the basis of the faction of capitalism that um so heavily supported the new right um so many of those industries were ones which were uh, benefited very heavily from um state spending sure um there was a, there was a stat in the in the Davis book where so much more state money was going to these capitalist enterprises the um, the heads of which were sort of preaching this very kind of like free market only free market free market orthodoxy kind yeah. of um, yeah. mantra and really they they were benefiting hugely from state and state investment mostly because a lot of these technologies were like um, aerospace companies and sort of like military defense contracting sure. and I suppose also to some extent like um, real estate real estate yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. or yeah. even like raw materials totally. probably like mm. quite heavily I mean now they're quite they're subsidized by yeah. the government and the like yeah. um, mm. and, and then the same with the sort of like uh, who would become the sort of like the, the tech oligarchs of the yeah. of, of California the Silicon Valley but yeah that quote I feel like was very Kropotkinian uh, <laughs> I, I feel maybe that shouldn't just uh uh, uh, attribute that the idea of like kind of like a general intellect of like building on the shoulders of giants just to Kropokin, but he does talk about it a lot sure. in um, Conquest of Bread, classic. Um, Peter but, Kropotkin, uh, mm, Russian anarchist, Russian anarchist, turn of the century. Yes, wow. yes, yes, yes. Big kind of just like you just kind of want to squeeze him Big when you see him. Guy. Wanna, another beard, <laughs> another beard, another beard. Yeah, yeah, weirdly yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, but a yeah, former prince. I think he he he, he yeah he was actually he a prince. Rid, yeah, he yeah. Uh, he he. Renounced his princely title. Wild. Um, and uh, became an anarchist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think also yeah. wrote an entry for an encyclopedia on. He was an anthrop- it was a um, anthropologist, I think. Of some, some hmm, that's cool. Yeah, did a lot of study in uh, Siberia. Oh wow, that's cool. Cool yeah. life. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, dude, dude. Yeah, the point I think I was going to make. If too, I have a name of boat. I mean, I'm like, it's going to be the Prince Peter Kropotkin. Wow. I don't know why I've decided it's a good name for a boat. That's a good name for a boat. That's a good name for a boat. Um, interesting. I like that a lot. <laughs> if, I a boat, if you ever name if a boat. If I ever name a boat. If you ever name a boat. <laughs> ridiculous Prince idea. Dan. <laughs> um, it's going to be a, a boat. Boat. <laughs> we were We were thinking about uh, building a boat. Oh, yes. So I, yeah, I talk about this quite a lot. With Mary. Sorry, you're not, you're not the only person. I've <laughs> oh, my God. Dan's cheating on me with building boat ideas. Um... Speaking of boats, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so the, the point that I think should be made about that idea of, like, you know, if you invent a computer chip, you're not actually inventing that computer chip because you had to, like, rely on the person who invented the, like, microprocessors or whatever. I don't, I don't know however it works. You have to even just rely on the person who's, like, getting the raw materials for you, right? So that, the one thing that always bugs me about this idea of, like, technological determinism among other things is, like, an idea that I think that they're tapping into here, which is, like... If you think that all of our problems are going to be solved by some sort of new invention, the new invention, it's going to solve everything. It's like, why? what makes you think that that would have happened now as opposed to 200 years ago? Yeah, because yeah, it's like, yeah. we've had the capacity to give everybody on the planet a great life since like before Kropotkin was writing. Like That was his point. Yeah, he was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. we could do this easily yeah, because yeah. we have a thing called like, of like we have like tractors you know what i mean <laughs> it's like so to think that like oh well now the internet's gonna do it the internet's gonna be the thing it's like dude like we could have done this so long ago yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that, I, mean? I mean i i, I my understanding is that there is an argument that says as soon as we had agriculture we had a yeah, exactly. like, <laughs> no kidding i don't know yeah yeah, yeah. The, 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 the fetter is not the technology people yeah the fetter totally. is in your head the fetter is in your mind mind fetters um 
What else should we... Oh, so there is a huge part of this where they go in to talk about the new labor relations that are being formed in this new virtual yeah, class. They get into yeah, a little yeah, bit of class yeah. analysis, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. What'd you make of that? Um, I don't know whether I want to would call it a class necessarily. Yeah, yeah. There was something, yeah, there was something very interesting in it though. I thought they were making a very materialist argument that I didn't see straight away. Um, mm. Basically, I, I mean, so that so they they define the what do they, the the, the virtual, virtual, the virtual class. class. Yeah. They define the virtual class as the, the sort of the, the tech entrepreneur, but also the various tech workers um, who are highly skilled and um, ended up being quite well paid and quite well remunerated for their work. Yeah. Um, but the trade off that was made was that they are uh, not kept on particularly good contracts, kind of thing. So yeah. they're always sort of like fighting for contracts. You could renewal. always just be fired. Uh, yeah, and there's so so. I mean, I, I guess we all have this vision of what it's like to work in Silicon Valley, right? Like they're really fun, like ping pong table. Like yeah. I mean, yeah, you're shaking your head. It's a bit <laughs> disgusting in some ways, isn't it? But like the but 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 the, the, but there ping is this table. but but there is this general breakdown between work and life, sure. right? Like. Sure. Um, they sort of like ra- rather than the hippies making their life about play, they've kind of like made their life about work in a way which is sort of meant to look kind yeah. of like fun and playful. They thought kind that of thing. like entrepreneur making their lives about their job and about entrepreneurship yeah, would yeah. give them an individual idea, yeah. but now it just made them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I thought it was quite an interesting sort of materialist argument that like um, t- t- based on the, the sort of like the skill level of these people and the amount that they were adding. Um, they had to find a new way of treating them yeah. uh, because they were so like so much of the California ideology is to answer the difficulty of like we really need these people hmm. uh, and there's a, there is a quote where it's like we, they couldn't like immiserate them or like um, they couldn't discipline them uh, in the same ways that the traditional workforce was disciplined through technology through sort of management through I don't know like sure. uh, through the factory form through um, yeah. Fordism and post the post Fordist workplace kind mm. of thing uh, and so they had to find other ways of sort of like incentivizing work and then disciplining at the same time kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it just seemed to have like, there seemed to be those um, constraints around the workplace and um, the disciplining of workers seemed to have like fed in very heavily to this developing sort of like yeah. Californian ideology and the culture around totally. Silicon Valley and tech in yeah. a lot of ways. You want to hear the most egregious example of exactly what you're talking about? Please. When you go to San Francisco, you see these like, big kind of like tour buses going around. Uh, They're all just like these silver tour buses. You're like, I wonder what what that is. And I've only ever been to San Francisco like twice, two or three times. But when I went up there once, I asked one of my friend's moms what they were. And she was like, oh, those are the buses that like take the tech workers to work in like Silicon Valley if you live in San Francisco. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like a free ride to work. She was like, yeah, they all have Wi-Fi on them because they expect you to work work on the the bus. bus. And it's just like, whoa. That's horrible. Yeah, Here's yeah. the well, thing. they don't call them campuses for nothing. Like, exactly. They, I don't know, yeah. You'd be living there before a long yeah. time. So. I, yeah, I know a couple of people who have gone to work for like Pixar and stuff, and I've been like, well, that's pretty cool. You have like the swimming pool, and you got like you can go down and get free muffins, and like, oh, dude, like you have like a tennis court, and they're like, you literally never get time to do any of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like yeah, you just yeah, sit in a dark room yeah. on a computer, yeah, yeah, yeah. moving Mickey Mouse's hand. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and at best, if you get a chance to do any leisure, you have to do it at work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my God, that's horrible. <laughs> Um, yeah, and uh, another thing, I'm just I'm just gonna complain about the goddamn San Francisco uh, existence. <laughs> the whole the the villainy whole... of San Francisco. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the Giants though. That's a whole other okay, level yeah, of whole villainy. Episode. Um, uh, there's been talk, and I think they're probably still going forward with this with creating okay so in california there's always been talk about building a high-speed rail and it's just been this like carrot on a stick dangled yeah, in front yeah, of you yeah, yeah. and they were like okay we'll do it between two towns that nobody cares about and it's just like in the desert and it's just like why <laughs> oh my god and it's going to cost a ton of money and it's just going to ruin the idea anyway there's been talk in uh, up north about building a privately funded high-speed rail from like sacramento or something like that uh-huh. to san francisco and along the bay funded by facebook or something like that and it's just like (laughs) god that just makes me so mad oh god and all these people root for the san francisco giants jesus that got caught in my throat (laughs) um god what was that was i'm just mad now i'm disgusted yeah uh technology bad um it's almost like this idea that the new right had about like 
market competition will give us all the best lives because we'll, it'll be everyone will be an individual in the market and we'll all be able to do the businesses and the tech that we want. It's almost like if you have competition, then you're going to have monopolization. Yeah. You're going to have monopolies yeah, 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 because yeah. you have to be competitive. Yeah. And if you're being competitive, you, okay, well, this is like capital, like chapter one stuff, but it's like if you invest all of your surplus, not all of your surplus, but like a good amount of the money that you make, as you have to do, because you want to be competitive, into your productive forces, then there are going to be monopolies because there are going to be people who can do that better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frustrating. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've reached a new level now where, like, um, quite a lot of tech firms are only productive, are only profitable when they're monopolies. Exactly. So much of the yeah. kind of, like, um, and it's it, and it's it's what's motivating a lot of, like, um, VC, like, venture capital investment in tech, right? They're sort mm. of, like, throwing money all over the place because there are just all these companies that are not remotely profitable at the moment. But um, if you hit on the right one, which manages to monopolize some corner of the market, um, then you're onto a winner, right? Like, yeah. I, don't know. I don't know how long like Netflix wasn't profitable for. Netflix, is, Netflix ne- still, ne- still isn't. Still not profitable. That's the thing okay. I was going to say. It's like none of these things are profitable. Yeah, yeah, Uber yeah, yeah. has never yeah, been yeah, profitable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, it took Amazon like 20 years. I don't think Amazon is <laughs> profitable. That's the thing. They just have money. They just Jeff Bezos just gets money. None of these things are profitable. Facebook might be profitable. I don't know. But Amazon isn't. Like, none of these uh, things uh, are profitable. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Stuff gets me so mad. I hate... Oh, my God. I but hate I think, it. But I think there is, there is something else to say about the general um, uh, the general nature of this form of liberalism, like uh, neoliberalism. Um, we, we should do a whole episode on neoliberalism, neoliberalism mm. quite soon. Um, one of my sort of, like, uh, basic understandings of how it functions is that, like, it's a form of liberalism that doesn't really believe in free markets, or at sure. least it does, but it believe, it believes in the necessity of the state sure. to institute free markets. Like free markets don't create themselves, and they have to the, the, the state has to make the free markets. Yeah, and really, they're they're actually it's it's clearly evident that the case they're not interested in sort of healthy markets without yeah. monopoly. They're mostly just interested in like funneling funds into like massive pots of money I mean I, a free market can't exist it's yeah, a perfect yeah, free yeah, market yeah, like yeah, an econ yeah. 101 yeah like, well, sorry we're assuming we're assuming the possibility of something that, that can't exist <laughs> I'm literally I'm like I mean the tendency right toward monopoly is always there yes the neoliberals sure. have just embraced it in a way which is sure <laughs> yeah I wonder and, and tech even more so so yeah. the apotheosis is apotheosis is that the opposite or apotheosis the... anyway the sort of like uh, the the pinnacle of that drive Ooh. toward uh, mm. uh Towards whatever the monopolism hell we're yeah. is tech. Sure, sure. I mean, there's a reason like so many of the companies listed on the S and P or like Dow Jones have become more valuable during the pandemic, and yeah. that isn't just because of a free market. <laughs> so, um, what else can we talk about this? Um, Why does he go after that? Do we want to do? Does the Jeffersonian <laughs> stuff? Doesn't he? I don't really yes. know very much about Jefferson, but I think it's probably important because um, it, it lays bare the um, the sort of like. The, the complete abandonment of any sort of social morals yes to um this kind of like rugged individualism yeah and uh building your fortunes and your fame off the back of um, um exploited mass of workers who were yeah. paid a pittance kind we, of that's right we should we should definitely go into that um i did find a good quote and i'll read this one because we can get into some transhumanism stuff Ooh. Ooh. um oh, tentacles <laughs> uh, where can I okay I'll start here across the world the Californian ideology has been embraced as an optimistic and emancipatory form of technological determinism yet this utopian fantasy of the West Coast depends on its blindness towards and complete dependence on the social and racial polarization of the society from which it was born Despite its radical rhetoric, the Californian ideology is ultimately pessimistic about real social change. Unlike the hippies, its advocates are not struggling to build an ecotopia or even revive the New Deal. Instead, the social liberalism of the new left and the economic liberalism of the new right have converged into an ambiguous dream of a high-tech Jeffersonian democracy. Interpreted generously, this retro-futurism could be a vision of a cybernetic frontier where high-tech artisans discover their individual self-fulfillment in either the electronic agora or the electronic marketplace. However, as the zeitgeist of the virtual class, the Californian ideology is at the same time an exclusive faith. If only some people have access to the new information technologies, Jeffersonian democracy can become a high-tech version of a plantation economy of the Old South. Reflecting its deep ambiguity, the Californian ideology's technological determinism is not simply optimistic, 
and emancipatory. It is simultaneously a deeply pessimistic and repressive vision of the future. This, I will say, this is written really well. It's this great. is a really, yeah. yeah, great thing. So a little bit of California stuff. Um, California is like the most racially segregated uh, big state there is. There's a huge argument, obviously, to be made about just like Los Angeles as the most racist city, <laughs> and definitely in America. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's in highly segregated, not just on an economic base, but on a racial base. The same is absolutely true for the Bay Area. Historically, um, Oakland was uh, like a, a, like the large black community. The East Bay was kind of like, the like, oh, don't go there, dude. Okay. Um, and San Francisco was like where the rich people live. That's still the case. Um, but now, like, the rich people kind of like are expanding into Oakland or expanding into the East Bay and stuff. Um, and so the point that they're making here is that, like, Central Valley, largely Hispanic, um, obviously working class and entirely almost agricultural, um, and like the poor kind of like service, um, based kind of like neighborhoods, uh, in the Bay area are still largely black. So they're saying that since not everybody has access to like the latest information streams, because there's just a price point, right? Not everybody can afford them. Um, it still relies heavily on the people who like, obviously in, you know, to take this to an extreme, you know, the countries like in central Africa, where we have to get the cobalt to build these things or even just like the agriculture workers in the central in the central valley so it's still entirely uh an ideology just based entirely on not just economic domination but complete racial domination sure right? yeah, yeah and it, this essay was written at a time when lots of um these uh, technological products were still manufactured in america so sure. in the essay yeah. they talk about this difference between like the tech worker who um the the, the class the oh, virtual class the virtual class so go. you've got the virtual class tech worker who's mm either the sort of tech entrepreneur or working in the developing the technology and then you've got the people who actually make the technology in the factories kind of thing sure. who are obviously paid a pittance and incredibly poorly uh, treated where is the kind of like um sort of like the access to the 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 agora or the digital yeah. agora or even the digital marketplace for yeah, those people exactly exactly um, and uh, obviously now all those jobs are like in China and Foxconn factories mm-hmm. where they have like suicide nets and people God. have to live at work. Talk yeah. about living at work. Talk about, about living like, at work. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, and then, yeah, of course, all of these people, I, I, I mean, the, 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 the more, the more these, the, the, the more there is the, this, the, this divergence in income and wealth, um, the more the sort of like, uh, the luxury lives of these people are serviced by yeah. all of these sort of poor and uh, undocumented workers in America, or in California, rather, whether it's just the child care or the gardening or sure. whatever, or the, agri- the production sure. for agriculture or whatever kind of thing. Yeah. Like these, the, the like, I mean, the, like the lifestyles of all rich people, they're maintained off of the exploitation of the poor in so many different ways. But like, mm. given that, um, so many of these, um, so much of the California ideology is to some extent at least predicated on sort of uh, democratization and then a sort of expanding mm. it into a more utopian future kind of thing they've got these massive because obviously this is massive ignorance and uh or, yeah. or to some, i mean the the essay goes on to sort of basically just show how um the tech industry and um the tech entrepreneurs and tech workers have just become so fearful of this sort of like unruly working class now that yeah. they've particularly after like the la riots and the like like mm. they're sort of seeking to be even more ghettoize themselves yeah um integrated communities and what was possible in the 90s and then they do a little bit of like um futuristic Ooh. speculation wet. about their, these people's ultimate aspirations may be was it wet <laughs> wet something the, command the, f wet the the, 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 the yeah the, the, yeah the desire to escape the wet wear of like <laughs> of uh, of the, the existing in a human body yeah and trans- i mean a lot of a lot of their aspirations seems to then be built around um artificial intelligence and to some extent like um transhumanism mm. like how how much can the human be combined with the machine Ugh. to the point where these people even potentially aspire to like exp- sort of like transcend human existence itself <laughs> leave the sort of like toiling poor behind and ascend into some kind of new mode of existence the, the desire to be made immortal by the fusion with technology kind of thing i need to take a shower after <laughs> you just said that. that's so horrible um wetware though, what wetware <laughs> extropian cult fantasies of abandoning the wetware of the human state the wetware 
I mean, that is in quotation phrase. marks. I don't want to know who it is that they're quoting. <laughs> um, okay, we'll stop saying wetware and post-human. <laughs> Please. Um, but instead, what's happened is something much more depressing, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. this vision of the future that we're faced with where there is this virtual class who works on stuff like that and all, all just like the uber wealthy. Um, and then there's just like if we use the San Francisco Bay Area as like a microcosm and then there are the people that serve them. And, you know, this is not necessarily just as agricultural workers or as daycare people or et cetera, et cetera. This is also just like in a much more, to me, just like sick sense of like uh, gig economy workers who just not workers at all and you just pay them for like the five minutes of their time that you need and they're not even thought of as workers it's like in a, even in a legal sense i think that that's like such a sick vision of the future that's like there are the people who get to enjoy the finer things in life and then the people who are paid for just enough of their time yeah. that you need them for it's disgusting it's absolutely yeah. disgusting and i hope that it doesn't seep into other industries but it certainly could right yeah. i mean just the idea of a freelance worker it's like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Ugh. Yeah. yeah the the heading of that section is cyborg masters and robot slaves wetware i'm fine with my wetware quite frankly <laughs> um anything else um i don't know what yeah. else can we, we talk we, about we, we, we could talk about the hypo- hypocrisy of jefferson maybe jefferson was uh, not a good dude yeah 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 yeah, a lot of it's interesting. We should read some early American, early early American, like that era um, labor history because he definitely did siphon off a lot of this class resentment that happened um, that was there before the Revolutionary War and indeed existed after it. Um, I think just because a lot of people didn't really care about the British Empire, quite frankly. Leaving that aside, um, he kind of siphoned this what should have been class resentment and made it just about again this individualism right mm-hmm. it's like i don't want the goddamn government to tell me what to do yeah john yeah, adams yeah. i wouldn't want john adams to tell me what to do either <laughs> but like um and it was also just explicitly racist Tradition. sure yeah i mean yeah from what i've learned from this i didn't know mm-hmm. very much about it before that like clearly sort of like fetishized the sort of uh, pe- peasant agriculture of the early expanding sort yeah. of the united states uh the sort of yeoman farmer yeah. kind of thing um that thought that uh, all, all americans presumably all white americans ought yeah. to be given a certain parcel of land and mm. it was their right to be able to sustain themselves off this what came from working that piece of land kind of mm. thing like to, yeah everybody should get the the due receipts from their the labor that they were able to put into things kind of thing mm. and then he, there he was writing all of this as this kind of like eastern establishment character who owned 200 <laughs> slaves and um, went to great lengths not to even have to interact with the slaves that he had kind of thing. That was a great bit of this essay where they talk about the dumb waiter yeah, dumb as waiter, a metaphor. Yeah, yeah, that just blew yeah, my mind because yeah, yeah. the metaphor was like, um, here's a guy who wanted to engage with this other class so little that he invented the dumb waiter. So he didn't even have to have a guy to bring him food, which would be bought to him by a box. He yeah. would have to look at the guy who would bring him food. <laughs> oh, God. Um, which is, yeah, which is basically... Ha- the same extent to which like the tech absolutely oligarchs are endeavoring absolutely. to like um to would you like your Uber driver from the from the, from the, the wet meat <laughs> from the, 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 fu- the goddamn wet meat uh would you like your Uber driver to talk to you or not <laughs> it's just like oh god okay um <laughs> thought that was a legitimate question <laughs> i don't want to hear the legitimate answer because it's probably my legitimate answer as well um in this new high-tech Jeffersonian democracy, the difference between masters and slaves endures in a new form. That kind of sums it all up. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. California they, they, yeah, I mean, they, sucks ass. Yeah, they make some <laughs> predictions for what, not necessarily what the future might be, but how the Californian ideology doesn't necessarily have to come to yeah. um, dictate the sort of like onward uh, how the onward march into this new technological future is carried out in still kind of technologically determinist i thought a little bit yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah although yeah, maybe yeah. they're coming at it from the other side of just being like but what about it if we use these well that means basically the argument that they, generally the argument they seem to be making was um the problem was the libertarianism of both of these camps and one one of the things that they say that unites both early on mm-hmm. like one of the things that unites sort of elements of the new left with elements of the new right was this sort of skepticism of the state mm. like obviously um the left were opposed to the sort of military industrial complex and they sort of had all these interactions with sure. like the reagan police state or whatever mm. or like uh, and obviously the the right um fetishizing the market and um opposed to state intervention of that kind of thing yeah that kind of sort that sort yeah. um the, they also did this piece much more advocating for like as europe develops these these t- into sort of like um 
this technological future, um, this, the state in various ways should be much more active. Yeah. I mean, it seems like looking back over the 20 years, about the limit, the amount that I understand it, if there's been any state regulation of these fields at all, it's been incredibly reactive sure. and not remotely um, totally proactive yeah. as, uh, as, as they would have advocated the, the right, the authors of this piece did advocate kind of thing. Mm. Um, yeah, absolutely. So. Even with all the like cookies stuff out here about like, uh, sorry, uh, EU says, sorry, Apple, you can't have a new charger or something like that. Yeah, like yeah, I mean, huge victories, it's, it does it's feel like, like the most. rest of Europe and the rest of the world to some extent, but particularly Europe has never really defined its own version of these technologies. They've yeah. kind of like adapted whatever it is that Silicon Valley has to offer mm. to a pot- potentially a slightly more regulated environment. And they do, it, it's funny because they do totally wind up just kind of, well, I mean, the, these guys are like, uh, the authors are very smart uh, dudes, um, you know, socialists to the core and stuff. But they also kind of end it with like, what about if it was just Keynesianism? What about yeah, if we just yeah, like yeah. paid normal people to like give everybody fiber optics? Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's funny. I mean, just, yeah, which is, which is still where we're at kind of now. So yeah. <laughs> some policy proposals are of that sort kind of thing. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, like the, the whole sort of like... Um, the Labour Party's commitment to like nationalising um, weather spins? Th- <laughs> no, unfortunately not. <laughs> no, the uh, uh, B- BT's fibre optic wing, so that they could like then roll like fibre optic yeah. internet all over the country and have this sort of nationalised uh, service for fibre optics. Which seems um, like would do nothing if not benefit. I mean, markets, like, but so yeah, like... I, well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's this kind of like. Um, it's exactly it's that kind of Keynesian intervention, right? Like, yeah. we need to build an infrastructure so that um, the capitalist markets can benefit. I mean, it, I don't know. That was the, that was kind of the case that was made out of one side of the mouth, I suppose. Um, so much of like, it's difficult, really. Like, so much of um, sort of like labor policy under John McDonnell was basically Keynesianism of that sort. Yeah. Um, but of course, the right would or, or the establishment was so terrified of him that they mm. weren't even willing to accept. Mm. All of these things what probably really would have been good for yeah. the British economy kind of thing. Um, yeah. So, um, yes. So, yes. What? I forget the name of the thing that I sent you, but we found out that Richard Barbrook, one of the authors, uh, makes board games. Yeah. He makes, like, yeah, communist yeah, board games. Of them, he, yeah. Yeah, you sent me a link, and then the one that it opened up on was, like, was space like, imperialism like, or something. It was, like, space it was basically <laughs> Yeah, it was basically a game, I assume, set in space, Yeah. based upon... Um, Lenin's text uh, ca- was it cap- was it cap- no imperialism the highest stage of capitalism so, or something. Yeah. Um, I like to play it. I don't yeah. know whether it's still in development. I couldn't work it out whether it's I in work development any of them. or there's a Facebook page. There was one called like, Reds versus Reds, which looked like fun. Nice, um, nice, nice, it was nice. all about I think like yeah. Uh, let us know if you want to see like a board game live stream yeah, sometime. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to yeah. get some people to play with us. Um, yeah. We did do. I oh, know we didn't. We were saying that we were going to do a proverbial hand reveal. What was that for? What were we holding? Do oh, I don't we know. Holding? It was a picture that Ed took of. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, The hand we reveal. We were setting a table. If we do the war game, the Richard Barbrook war games, um, hand reveal. Hand reveal. We'll see our hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should. We also have a like vague connection to Richard Barbrook, so we should. We could. Yeah, maybe he'll play. Oh, is he that alive? would be so. Good. He's alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Is he> alive? <laughs> I have to check. <laughs> this was written in 1995. Yeah, I don't know how old he might have been. That was 25 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, people die. Unfortunately. People do indeed unfortunately, die. Unfortunately, we haven't we haven't escaped the wet wear yet. <laughs> we haven't escaped the wet wear. Um, Our mortal wet coil. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This, we, should, we should reach out. We should reach out. We should reach out. That'd be really cool. This. Um, Rock. Just to play the game. We don't, I don't, I don't, the I'd game. be too embarrassed to like talk actual serious yeah. things. Like, yeah. Just get him to play his board games. He's probably reactionary now. Yeah. yeah he's Still much, <laughs> now, that, now that he's developing his, his revolutionary board game <laughs> yeah. empire, yeah, he's, exactly. become, he's, he's become an um, ardent uh, just free, mar- I feel... free marketeer. <laughs> exactly. Just because I feel bad that we didn't read it. I'm just going to read the first paragraph just because it is so good. Um, first section titled, As the Dam Bursts. So this is how the whole essay begins. At the end of the 20th century, the long-predicted convergence of the media, computing, and telecommunications into hypermedia is finally happening. Once again, capitalism's relentless drive to diversify and intensify the creative powers of human labor is on the verge of qualitatively transforming the way in which we work, play, and live together. By integrating different technologies around common protocols, something is being created which is more than the sum of its parts. With 
When the ability to produce and receive unlimited amounts of information in any form is combined with the reach of global telephone networks, existing forms of work and leisure can be fundamentally transformed. New industries will be born and current stock market favorites will be swept away. So yeah, that was 1995. I don't know. I guess like Windows 95 would have just been coming out. Um, Can't really think of like what computers were like back then, but it's like, man, they both got it. Yeah, they figured yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly yeah. what happened. Yeah, um, and, you know, sort of a new age of capitalism was dawning. Yeah. Um, so we get to think that that can just kind of happen. And I mean, like, we all knew that it was going to be like this, you know, the internet was going to be this huge thing. But like, yeah, they make it that it wasn't just this new piece of technology and that, you know, okay, now we all have phones in our pockets. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, it transforms everything, even our social relations, which is horrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, well, that's technological determinism. Uh, anyway. Oh, <laughs> uh, horseshoe theory. I don't know. Yeah, we need to do better at passing that, that distinction, I think. Yeah. Um, how can we make that not technologically determinist? Well, I suppose that the social relations... Well, of... the social relations remain the same to some extent. Like yes. They, they, yeah. they, it changes the way in which um, classes interact. Yes. But, the, the, but the, the, the basic relationship between classes, the, 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 what's, what's governing this process is... Um, the desire from capitalists to make as much money as possible make and money. also to discipline and exploit their workforces um, to the best of their ability. But they're not even making... I mean, they are making money. <laughs> making they are money making money. Somehow. I but don't I don't know, know where I don't it comes it. from. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. It's fictitious. It's, it's, it's fictitious. fictitious. I mean, money is money is yeah. just kind of a thing, isn't it? Um, that rocked. I really, really liked that. And that uh, puts a nice bookend on our little two-part California yeah, little, series. Little, 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 little California. We're not painting it very well. No. No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> um, Did you want to? Yeah. Eh, I mean, it's hard to with all that. It's beautiful, I'll say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah Possibly, yeah. I mean, just because it's enormous. Um, I'd like to go. Beautiful place I would really planet. quite like to go. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, rocks. Other than all of the horrible things that have come out of it since it's the beginning. Um, I think just the way that it was uh, bought into the fold of the United States set the tone mm-hmm. because there... There is an explorer, uh, a guy named Fremont, who went on three big journeys from like, the, well, from Missouri to like go explore. I used to really California. fetishize these kind of characters. I know, the kind of like if you mountain read, men, sort of like. Yeah, uh, totally. Uh, if you read, I've read the journal, his journals from his first two trips, and it is so cool, dude. Uh-huh, yeah. It's just like, it gives you know, obviously, like he goes through like whole parts of like you know, Mon- not Montana, but like uh, the Rockies, and it's just like, you know the Great Plains and stuff, just buffalo everywhere, and it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you could yeah. just live off the land. Oh, it's sure. so cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, the reason he was doing that was to go kind of scout out California and see, like, maybe we can take this from Mexico if there were to ever be a war. And he was the <laughs> oh, one who, like, <laughs> incited the bear flag revolt of all of the, like, white guys living in California to, like, rise up against the, like, Mexican government uh-huh. and the rest is history. That's how California's bought into the fold and it's continued to just kind of be uh, racially bad and everything till it. Pio Pico, I believe, who was a governor of California back when it was Mexico. I think it was Pio Pico. He kind of could see the way that the winds were blowing, seeing that there was going to be a war with America, even though they hadn't done anything. Mm -hmm. And um, he was a Mexican guy, obviously. um, And he had a famous speech where he basically said, um, if this happens, I worry that they're going to treat us the same way that they've treated our brothers and sisters on the East Coast, basically the Native Americans. Sure. And that just yeah. fucking just sends chills down your spine. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. that's what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly yeah, what happened. Was it the Mexican-American war like Mexico shrunk like by yes. four fifths of its size yes. or something? Like yeah. it was enormous. And it went all the way through like so Oregon, much. maybe even up to Washington and out to like Colorado. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you're just like, nope. All the way there. Rio Grande, baby. Yeah. Well, not quite, but that was later. Anywho. <sighs> anyway. You know what? I don't think we introduced the podcast at the start of the... This is Auxiliary Statements. My yeah, name's Jack. Yeah. I'm Dan. How are you doing, Dan? <laughs> I'm all right. I'm oh, right. how are those beans? Yeah, still nothing. You're right. I'm I don't know why. Check. I'm not meant to check. I'll have a look on them tomorrow. Mm, mm. Yeah, I had a check. Maybe they're not getting enough water. Well, the thing is, is like, it just rains so much. It's like, what are we going to do? Water them? Yeah. I guess you guys are paying a glass over the top of yeah, them. Yeah, that's right. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're quite cozy, my broad beans. They are. They're a big, big double glazed. I could live in there. Yeah. Come out one day. I'm living in there. I mean, it's a yeah, it's a it's a better piece of double glazing than there's in any of the windows in my house. <laughs> um, well, bean update Here we go. complete. Here we go. Do we do we um do we know how Giuliani's doing? 
Uh, no, I saw you tweeted feeling strong or something like okay. that, and I was like, sure you are, <laughs> sure you are, buddy. Relative to what? <laughs> yeah, really, exactly. Yeah, relative to Trump, I don't know. Uh-huh. God bless him. Noam Chomsky, check in. I'm sure he's still alive. Still alive. I haven't seen Henry yet. Kissinger. I have no idea. Presumably still alive. Presumably. What a world. <laughs> crazy, yeah, fucking crazy. Those guys are still alive. Um, <laughs> once again, one of the cats has sat next to me for the entire time. It's been quite quiet. It's good. Nice. nice. Um, and yes, I think that about does it. Californian ideology. We did it. Richard yes. Barber, Andy Cameron, rocks. Hopefully we'll get around to playing one of his games soon. Reds versus Reds, perhaps, or Space Communists, whatever it's called. <laughs> space Imperialism. Space Imperialism. <laughs> and yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you, Chuck. It's been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. Um, <laughs> I feel like we just introduced the podcast, but this I has been. I, I was, yeah, I mean, I've given up, like, the first, the first time we did it many episodes ago, uh-huh. I was like, all oh, this is a problem. Yeah, uh, I don't care. Yeah, they know. You guys know. You know. It's nicer this way. Um, we've had a couple listeners, by the way, who have been kind of like, listening to like kind of new episodes as they come out so and people who dan and i don't know so yeah thank you made this realization the other day yeah, so thank you very much listen to this now perhaps who have no idea who we are other than through the medium of this podcast we had a couple listeners in sweden and we had one listener in the philippines isn't that cool Ooh, yeah shout out to our filipino friends um yes there you go. all right well <laughs> this has been auxiliary statements i'm jack Dan. and thank you for the music you heard this episode was music to kill bad people too by king gizzard and the lizard wizard if you like this song you can check it out and much much more on their band camp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com be sure and follow us up on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you like what you heard, be sure and tune in next week for some more comedy discussion. Till next time.